Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is I, Emily Sophia, aka M Mighty Sophia, and I'm back. <laughs> it's been a long time. I took a longer hiatus than I expected to, but I figured what finer way to return to form than to review John Wick Chapter 2. Now, this review is going to be crafted in such a way that you can appreciate it whether or not you have seen the new film. If you've seen it, great. If you haven't, I'm not going to spoil any major plot points for you. Now, this being said, you should definitely check out the original film as soon as you can and then hightail it on back here for my review. So as you can see, I've got my John Wick inspired tactical attire. I don't know if you can see my blazer, my turtleneck. I am ready to go. So if you choose to stick around for this review, then I embrace your open ears with open arms. Now, here we go. So I will never forget the exhilaration that I fell back in 2014 as I was pressed up against the back of my theater seat on the violent, propulsive roller coaster that was John Wick. Just a wounded man whose only plan was to settle down with his parting gift puppy, but found himself royally dicked over by a Russian gang who killed his companion and made off with his Mustang out of blind entitlement and spite. The sadistic act rips Baba Yaga out of retirement and into gun-slinging action. The fuse is lit and Wick makes like a bloodhound hot on the heel of revenge. Over the 101 minute runtime, we watch the firearm toting boogeyman dodge the crooked killers who would rudely violate the rules of the Continental Hotel to claim the multi-million dollar bounty that is on his head. You gotta pay those student loans from assassin school somehow. And we get to behold the unholy spectacle as he takes his A game to a ritzy nightclub, cathedral, safe houses, and a waterfront helipad, which forms the sprawling urban stage on which he systematically eliminates every thug and shot caller between himself and uh, peace of mind. For a man like John Wick, as we learn in the sequel, ceasefires are at best temporary and permanent exits our illusions. So John Wick Chapter 2 proves that our badass yet browbeaten hitman is ensnared not only in his profession and the enterprise of which it is part, but in its violence. This is a language he knows well and speaks with eloquence. And when you really consider why John Wick does what he does, looking beyond the fact that he learned how to do it and he's good at it and he made a living from it, you realize that the carnage he enacts here especially in the latter half of the film, is not just some perverse Hollywood glorification of gun violence or a mere fight for his life. Neither was what we witnessed in the preceding film. Here, in John Wick Chapter 2, the violence is a manifestation of something far different. At its core, it comes across as this contract with one's darkest, truest self. When John Wick is on the warpath, his sense of love and loss weaponizes him. He abides by the law of retaliation, but brings his own acute sense of indignation into the proceedings after that. Whatever is stolen from him, a mourning period, a canine cohort, a slick set of wheels, a space for honoring his wife's memory, he doles out retribution in spades. And don't expect him to plant daisies on the graves he leaves in his wake. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to John Wick's what is John Wick's, but make it tenfold because you effed up. <laughs> Although he's not so much talk as he is walk, it becomes clear to the vigilant viewer that John is fueled by a meld of discipline and tacit trauma, and he finds himself hemmed in by a complex institution that forgives and forgets not, and whose players can never fully make their way off the chessboard. John tried to forfeit the game and make a life with Helen, but the choices we're discovering he made to do so, and the ways he's responded to the atrocities committed against him since, show that his past, his instincts, grief, and rage have fused into a matrix of obsession. <laughs> He's signed on the dotted line of his own curse. The things that make him human are what make a man with his determination and modus operandi so monstrous and worthy of such a title as Boogeyman. And the Reaper, I think, is a nice moniker as well. You know you got Jack the Ripper? John the Reaper. I approve. <laughs> All this to say, claiming that Wick is any sort of tragic hero or even a victim would be missing the mark, which, as it turns out, Baba Yaga seldom does. 
Similarly, I can think of few moments where the film's aim is anything less than dead on. With the same level of focus, commitment, and impeccable style that John Wick brings to a job, John Wick Chapter 2 displays the titular assassin's descent into the bloodbath of a blood oath gone awry and an inescapable contract with his inner turmoil. Hell, everything in this movie is a contract within a contract, a deal within an even seedier deal that raises the stakes till the air is as thin as a barber's freshly sharpened razor. It's thrilling, relentless, and tailor-made for the theater experience. It's bursting at the seams with diverse, flawlessly choreographed combat, an all-star cast of colorful kingpins and killers for hire, delightfully morbid humor that's as dry as a bitter wine, and a stunning clash of settings. You've got like an ancient Roman necropolis, you have a vibrant labyrinthian modern art museum, a gritty urban underworld, and a bright white underground transit terminal where a few passersby seem phased by the frenzy. <laughs> John Wick is a mythical figure in a world of tempestuous deities who live to break the very rules they create and forge alliances as if solely to subvert them. These are so-called Old Testament divinities who demand blood sacrifices and who extend not mercy but professional courtesies as they wink and clink their glass against yours. The first ten or so minutes also tie directly into the events of the previous film and to wondrously ferocious and comedic effect. We have the privilege of watching John Wick deal with a loose end left from his one-man war against the Russian mob. And this matter of business involves some soul-rending metal-on-metal action and pointed reminders that John's wrath cannot be outrun. A man does well to avoid holding on to one of John's belongings, that's for sure. Lord have mercy on the man who borrows one of his Blu-rays and loses it in the couch cushions, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But getting back to Old Testament territory, I've got to hand it to Winston, the manager of the New York's Continental. Uh, most of my favorite quotes from the film belong to Ian McShane's omnip omnipotent proprietor, whose godhood seems almost on par with Wicks, and that's not just because he's playing an actual god in the upcoming ad adaptation of Neil Gaiman's American Gods. There is a scene with Winston that evokes this passage from the Bible in which God is showing his fearsome power to a man called Job, who lost his livestock, his home, his capital, his entire family, and he's calling everything into question. Does that sound like anybody else we know? <laughs> now, Winston has a way of asserting his godlike dominion with spectacle, and his grace, should he extend it, is sufficient for any assassin under siege. He's the sage-composed authority who occupies the continental grounds like the Spirit of the Lord inhabiting the Israelites' tabernacle in biblical lore. And he understands his patrons' every motive and intention, deciding who stays in the fold, who stands trial, and who pays the ultimate price. I'm fascinated to see how the franchise may expand his legacy further. That's all I will say. Oh, and at 74 years of age, you'd be a fool not to hit that. Also, props to Ruby Rose for bringing finesse and menace to the role of Ares, who is a mute assassin extraordinaire and right-hand woman to the cutthroat Italian mobster, Santino D'Antonio. And we've also got Lawrence Fishburne's scenery-chewing Bowery King. My only complaint related to him is that the marketing overplayed his integral but minor role in the film, so I felt a little bit too well-versed in his one-liners by the time I finally got to meet him and see what he was all about. Still, charming fellow, and you'd be dead inside if you weren't feeling that Neo-Morpheus reunion. We also get to see Claudia Gerini playing one of the film's two female leads, and her scenes are so gorgeous and devastating that you would think that they were lifted from unused footage for NBC's Hannibal. Also, Lance Reddick's convivial concierge at the Continental remains a sly, understated fan favorite. And I hope we get to see more of Reddick and high art blockbusters of John Wick's caliber. Common also took up the mantle of another cool, capable assassin whose confrontations with Wick bring some rather unexpected but welcome comedy to the table. Their dynamic was easily one of my favorite aspects of the film. Arguably, it's more deep-seated than, or more straightforward than the deep-seated connections Wick shares with some of the other power players in the assassin game, 
but their interactions still show us a great deal about their world and their personal and communal honor systems too. The mutual sense of respect between them reminds us that in this universe, savagery and civility are two sides of the same coin of humanity. The two always coexist, even when one side or the other is facing up. I must also applaud the dream team of writer Derek Kolstad and director Chad Stahowski, whose name I've never said out loud. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thank them for bringing this rich electric world to life. Tyler Bates and Joel J. Richard for another exquisite soundtrack that I'm sure to visit when my work days grow stale. And Dan Lawson for the mesmerizing cinematography that reminded me just how much I loved Crimson Peak. The production was also figuratively on fire. There is just a hell of a lot of talent that went into this film. I don't think it's a spoiler to comment on the prospects of a sequel, and many of you have probably already put your ears to the ground and listened for the telltale rumbling of a trilogy announcement. I mean, the sheer title of John Wick Chapter 2 suggests a continuation, and I will say that the ending all but guarantees a climactic return for John the Reaper. Now this film, while extravagant in nearly every damn way, is less of a standalone flick than its precursor, but honestly it makes perfect sense, and it's warranted. So as I bring this review to a close and mull over some of the movie's core themes in my pulsating brain, um, I'm left intrigued by the oaths and vows that bind these assassins in the world of John Wick to one another. And those bonds are signified with these ornate medallions that are put in circulation by the Continental. So owing someone is what plunges Wick further into his personal hell in chapter two, as his debt to a single man puts him firmly back on the chessboard that I mentioned earlier. To owe is to basically surrender autonomy in exchange for an otherwise unattainable end, but being owed is an equally grave responsibility. While oaths themselves are impartial, human subjectivity, of course, taints the objectivity. And even after a contractual bond is fulfilled, ostensibly freeing both parties in the process, another may concurrently exist or come into effect after the former is complete. I'm talking about backstabbery here, okay? <laughs> so these unspoken yet sacred covenants, they threaten the civility that men like Winston seek to maintain. What they do is they destabilize an institution that purports to sustain human dig dignity and suppress the animalistic urges that can unravel even the most seasoned professional in the murder game. So John Wick Chapter 2 shows how vengeance is an internalized contract with no end terms. How alienation from the normal world can leave an assassin to believe that they can just as easily walk away from the business as bury their blood-soaked armaments and assets in the basement and cover them with homemade cement, when in fact an old contact can show up at their doorstep out of the blue, promising them freedom from a life that they thought was already foregone. So in this world, clearly, to live is to owe, and to die is to settle? I'll let you guys be the judge of that, but uh, I wanted to leave you with a quote that came to mind as I was thinking about all this stuff of assassin pledges and blood oaths, and this is a little quote from Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 3. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing doles the edge of husbandry. This above all to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. So that is my quick and dirty breakdown of John Wick chapter two. There is so much more that I could say, but I beseech you, whether or not you have seen the film, take it to the comments down below. And if you do want to bring up anything in spoilery territory, 
please preface it as such and then we can talk. So. Yeah, it's great to be back. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that is kind of my main social media hub outside of YouTube and the like. I am also Mighty Sophia there, as I am here on YouTube, and I will keep you all informed of some other social media outlets that I'm going to be exploring um, as a platform for Mighty Sophia stuff in the future. So yeah, anything that I forgot, of course, this is a relatively spoiler-free review. Um, I would love, love to hear your thoughts and reactions. I'm going to be back very soon with more of my traditional reviews, and there are a lot of new things coming. So thank you for being patient. Thank you for sticking around. And as always, I will be back before you know it.